Good morning and welcome. It's good to see even more folk back this morning to, to, to be with us and a welcome to all who are joining us online as well for our worship in DL St. Andrews. Bells ringing, the people are here and there's even better news because for the first time in several months our Sunday school is back. They can't be in the church with us because of physical space but through the wonders of modern technology if everything works we're going to be able to say hello to them, are we? There they are. I think they can, can they see us? Yep. They can, so can we just, good morning Sunday school. Give them a wave. <laughs> May God bless you in your lessons and your fun this morning and just being together. And we'll see you later outside as we finish. This is us testing out new technology. We'll be able to do more with that later on as we see them, but that's great. But this morning we come to worship the Lord. We come from the busyness of the week, the stresses of the world, all that's going on into the presence of the one who loves us and holds us. And as we begin our worship this morning, Fraser is going to sing for us the, 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 the well-known words of the Lord's my shepherd. So let's listen and worship to these words. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul, and I will trust in you alone, and I will trust in you alone. For your endless mercy follows me, your goodness will lead me home. He guides my way in righteousness, and he anoints my head with oil, and my cup it overflows with joy. I feast on his pure delight. And I will trust in you alone. And I will trust in you alone. For your endless mercy follows me. Your goodness will lead me home. And though I walk the darkest path, I will not fear the evil one, for you are with me and your rod and staff are the comfort I need to know, and I will trust in you alone, and I will trust in you alone. For your endless mercy follows me, your goodness will lead me home, and I will trust in you alone, and I will trust in you alone, for your endless mercy follows me. Your goodness will lead me home, for your endless mercy follows me. Your goodness will lead me home. 
Thank you, Fraser. Let's pray together. For we trust in you alone. You who leads us by the still waters, you who renews us in your presence. You who guides us through the dark valleys and sees us into your love. And so this morning, Lord, we come to Jesus Christ and we come with all our worries and anxieties looking for your guidance and your peace. Today, Lord, as we pray for ourselves, we would also pray for our nation. We pray for those elected just in the last days, for those disappointed, and Lord, for those that were retiring too. We thank you for them. And we ask that you would guide them too as you would guide all of us with integrity and justice and kindness in all they do. We pledge to pray, Lord, for all of your kingdom to come in the midst of our broken world. And this Sunday, Lord, we also, at the start of Christian Aid Week, pray beyond our country to the whole of the world and to all your suffering and struggling people for justice and renewal, for peace and healing. And as we do that, Lord, we come and we ask that in your mercy and grace, you would take us. Forgive us our selfishness and our struggles and lead us, Lord, in a place that we are able to serve you in all that we do. As we pray in Jesus' name, the words that he taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. This is the start of Christian Aid Week, and I'm just struck as I was sipping from my water here how easily we assume that we have got things like water, breakfast, and all the things that we take for granted that so many in the world don't have. So to begin our thoughts on Christian Aid Week, there is a brief film that we're going to watch just now. <laughs> Kwa <laughs> Lakini ngai ya ndeve siya, o ino akwa tiye vina. Kalibu, kalibu. 
Ni ndio matungia mwea kiasi wanga ya make na saa angiasia pombe sisi na umie wanga ya ongelele vo We're going to hear, we're going to read together God's Word just now then. So I'm going to start off with reading the Gospel lesson, which is coming from Matthew chapter 7, and I'm going to be reading from verse 15. Let's hear God's Word. Jesus says, watch out for the false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves by their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a, a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruits, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. And then we read from God's word from the book of James. And we're reading from James chapter 2, reading verses 14 to 25. James writes, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or, or daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs. What good is that? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, well, you have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. 
You believe that there's only one God? Well, good. But even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see, that a person is considered righteous by what they do, not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds, is dead. Amen. And thanks be to God for His Word. We're continuing this morning looking at the book of of James, um, James chapter 2. And what I've been saying as we've been going through the book of James is this is really, really practical stuff. It's, It's all about how we live out the faith that we have. And we said before, James, when, when some folk have looked at it, they said, oh, this, this book seems a bit lightweight. It's not got deep teaching in it. But that's because James assumes the gospel message and then begins to ask us that question, so what? How does this relate to our lives and the way that we live? The book started off um, by saying in, in chapter 1, verse 1, James, a servant of God, and the Lord Jesus Christ. James, a servant of God, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as I mentioned before, James was almost certainly the natural brother of Jesus. He was the son of Mary and Joseph. Paul tells us in Corinthians that when Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to his brother James. And not only that, James then became a believer in Jesus, which he hadn't been before, and James went on to do more than that. He became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. After the other disciples had to flee Jerusalem because of the persecution, James became the leader of the church and a wise and respected and influential leader. And yet when he starts this letter, he says simply, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Could have said, James, the brother of Jesus, the bishop of Jerusalem, the one that the Lord appeared to and given all his credentials, but he doesn't do any of that. And I I said before that that was a mark of his humility. As he's addressing these other Christians, he doesn't say, oh, look how important I am. In fact, right through his letter, he simply calls them his brothers. You, like me, have a relationship with Jesus because of what he's done for you, and we are brothers And so James's humility shines through this letter, that we all serve the same Lord. But I think actually there's more than that. James, a servant or a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can say today, and in fact, I would encourage you just to to say it to yourself, Alistair, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Linda, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. David, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Willie, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because in saying that, we're not just talking about our humility. We're actually saying something about who we are in the world. This is what defines me. This is what people should see when they look at me. They should see simply, I serve Jesus. I serve Jesus. The servant in a household or in a business is in the background. Not trying to take the floor, but they're noticed by what they do and how they serve. It defines me. And and just that little thought of what does it mean to follow Jesus? I I, I keep coming back to this because it's, it's a very simple idea. A follower of Jesus is someone who follows Jesus. 
Uh, and that doesn't just mean sort of follows him around. And, uh, uh, it actually means, you know, like playing Simon Says. You know that game where you follow, where you imitate, where you begin to reflect? And, and that's really the heart, I think, of this whole letter, that, that idea, because you know, right through it, we hear the teaching of Jesus is that if we are going to be servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to follow him. We're going to show the love that Jesus showed. We're going to be defined by the compassion that Jesus had. We're going to react to people the way that Jesus reacted to the marginalized and the excluded and the guilty. We're going to do it with that sort of grace in our lives, that sort of forgiveness. And then we, we, we looked on to the second chapter, and I've just taken the first verses of the two chapters here, the second chapter where James began by saying, my brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Believers in Jesus. And there he's talking about believing in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and that's something about what we believe. We believe in Jesus. We believe that he's the Savior. We believe that he's the Messiah. We believe that in Jesus of Nazareth, we see the glory of God. We said last week, this is the doctrine of the incarnation. This is the Christmas message, that the glory of God was in Jesus. But to believe in him also has the meaning of to trust in him. And James goes on from there to say that must influence how we treat people. We don't show favoritism. And that's not just because it's not a nice thing to do. It's because if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're following his example. And how did he react to people? It wasn't with being impressed by the wealthy or, 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 or looking after his pals. It was with that even-handed love for all. But it's more than that because it also transforms our relationships because the thing that, that brings us together is what Jesus has done for us. And that means we're all the same. Whether you're good or bad or whether we think you're, you're friendly or unfriendly or whether you're annoying the absolute heck out of me or whether you've been really kind to me, it, it, it doesn't in one sense matter because all of us are together because of the grace of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross and when he rose again. And as we stand together at the foot of the cross, we stand equally. And that has implications socially. In fact, all of the New Testament epistles in some ways are working out what does it mean to live together, Jew and Gentile? What does it mean to live together, slave and free? What does it mean to live together, man and woman? What does it mean to live together, rich and poor? What does it mean to live together? What does it mean to live out this life where we are all in grace? And today's passage goes further than that. Because what James is saying very clearly is faith must have deeds. It must have concrete expression. You can believe that Jesus is the Messiah. You can believe that he died for your sins. You can believe that he rose again. You can believe that he's promised you eternal life. You can believe that he's the Lord of the universe and the Savior of the world. But if it's saving faith as opposed to a bunch of doctrinal stuff in your head, then it has to change the way you live. It has to result in deeds, or it's not saving faith at all. Now, this is quite important as we try to understand this passage. James is not saying your deeds save you. He would agree with what Paul says when he says we are saved by faith in what Jesus has done. But if that faith doesn't show itself in deeds, it's not real faith. It's not really following Jesus. And the example he takes is, is very clear. He starts off with saying, if a brother or sister, notice a brother or sister, person who is a Christian, comes into church and has no clothes, imagine that. <laughs> it's maybe a little bit of a hyperbole, but has struggling to provide the basics, or has no food, and you look them in the eye and you say, go in peace, keep well, be well fed, may God bless you, but you do nothing at all to help their situation, then your words are completely useless. Now, what James is saying here isn't just, oh, you should, you should help people that are in need when they come into church. 
or, or, or are part of your, your group. That's obvious. In fact, his readers would have agreed with that. What he's actually saying is something bigger than that. Words, professions of faith, are hollow and nothing unless they result in actual actions. This isn't just a, a command to feed people. It's a command to allow what we believe to transform us. And if Paul did this in, in very clear ways, it's interesting he says, if the person that comes in doesn't have their daily food, and that same expression is used in the book of Acts, where it says that they made a distribution on a daily basis within the church, within the, the, the early, early church in Jerusalem, to those who were in need. They had a sort of church fund which made sure it was particularly widows um, in the congregation who were struggling. They made sure everybody had enough. That was what they practically did, how they lived the whole thing out. They had a welfare system as it was. And that's what we need to do as well. We need to have whatever we're doing, whatever our structures are, showing and living out the faith that we've got. If I give you a concrete example of what James about here when he says words need to have form, sometimes when we close a meeting, we, we say the grace together, don't we? And we say to one another, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Yeah? It's a blessing. We're blessing each other. May grace be yours. Let me ask you this question. When you say those words, do you mean them? Or do you just say them? Because stop and think about what you've just said. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be yours. May the unwarranted, undeserved love of God flow into your lives. May you know God's goodness even when you don't deserve a word of it. I am asking that for you. That's my prayer. I cannot in any integrity pray that the Lord would show you grace if I'm not going to show you any. So if I say in a meeting, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be yours, and then I go out from that meeting, and in my heart is, ha! How did he treat me like that? Nobody can treat me like that. Nobody could say that. Then what I'm actually saying is, I bring judgment on your life. And I feel righteous in doing that. Maybe I, maybe I should, because maybe you have behaved badly. But I'm going to show you no grace. I'm not going to go out wanting to forgive you. I'm not going to go out wanting to build you up. So what I have done when I have said, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be yours, is I have lied. This is as much as somebody coming into a meeting and I say, go away, be well fed. Does it shape how we actually act? Do I therefore, as I say, may grace be yours, stop and think, what is it that you don't deserve that I want to bring into your life that will build you up and affirm you, and show you the love of God, your Father, who loves you even when you don't deserve it, because he loves me when I don't deserve it. You try and be angry with someone praying that. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Try and be cheesed off with a bunch of people who are just not treating you right, and then say, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be yours, and then embody it. I mean, we could go on with words that we say that, that can mean nothing. Husbands, I'm sorry. I'm not the only one that says that occasionally. Do you mean it? Do our deeds reflect the fact that we're sorry or is it words? I love you. Are you showing it? You can go on and on with that. What does it mean to embody these things together? Jesus points about this when he talks about the fruits and the trees. If you've got a good tree, it bears fruit. It's not bearing fruit. It's not a good tree. It's as simple as that. How do you know a tree is healthy? It brings fruit. How do you know the life is a real life of faith? It displays the fruit and how it acts, and particularly how it acts to its brothers and sisters. That's why Jesus says that there's going to be a bunch of people who say, Lord, Lord, 
And Jesus will say, I never knew you. I never had a relationship with you. You were never hanging out with me. You were never really following me. You went around saying you were my people and you loved me and you believed this and you should believe that and all the rest of it. But you just weren't mine. You weren't living the way I wanted you to live. You weren't loving the way I wanted you to love. I don't know what you were doing, but it was nothing to do with me. It's a really, really hard warning. And then this passage uses something else. You see, James refers to the greatest theologian, perhaps, in the world. Somebody who knows all the truth and all the Bible backwards. And I'm talking, of course, of Satan. Nobody knows more about God than the devil does, apart from God himself. Now, why does James bring up Satan? He says this, look, the devil, the demons believe everything that's true. They know who the Lord is. They know what he's done on the cross. They know his victory. They know he rose from the dead. They know all this stuff, and it drives them insane. They shudder when they think of what he's going to do when he returns in full judgment. They believe all that stuff, but they're still demons. So don't have the knowledge and the thought that if you believe all the right things, that's you sorted. It needs to transform who you are and who you serve. And then he takes another example, and it's the example of, of Abraham. And Abraham is, is very important because Abraham is the father of the Jewish people. In fact, the father of all who believe he's called in the Bible. And Abraham, says James, he says he showed his faith in, in this let me read the bit from verse 21. Was Abraham our father considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Abraham didn't have a Bible. Abraham didn't have the Old Testament. Abraham lived before Moses lived. He didn't know all the things that we know about God, but what he did have was a relationship with God. He was a friend of God. He trusted the Lord. He trusted his promises. And Paul will take Abraham and, and, and he will say, look, Abraham shows you that you don't need all the Jewish law. You don't need all, the, 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 all these things. What matters is that you believe the promises that God has given to you. And James says, yes, but that's true, but Let's look beyond that because Abraham believing in God and trusting his promises meant Abraham did things. God said, I will give you a promised land and I will give you a nation. And Abraham didn't just say, yes, I believe that. I trust that 100%. He actually left his hometown age 70 and traveled to a new land. So if you're sitting there thinking, I'm too old, <laughs> think about that. And then he believed God that God would give him children. And he kept believing that till he was 99. So if you think God's finished with you, <laughs> don't give up. And then he had a child, Isaac, the son of the promise. And God said to him, I want you to sacrifice your son. You know the story. And he loved God so much that he took the action of taking his son up the mountain ready to do it until God told him, no, don't. Now, the message of the story is not sacrifice your children on the communion table next week, as tempting as that might sometimes be. That's not the message. You see, we know more about God than Abraham did because we've got the Bible he didn't have. We've got the Lord Jesus Christ having revealed God's love to us, so we know that God doesn't actually want us to kill our children. Abraham didn't know that. But what Abraham did, which we don't have, was a willingness to say, I know these things, I trust these things, I believe these things, and therefore, I will put my life on the line for it. I will put my family on the line for it. I will put my future on the line for it. I will actually do it. And what James is saying is, if you say you've got a faith, a saving faith, and it isn't transforming you like that, 
It's dead. It's just words. Now, actually, a lot of people have said James and Paul are are, are disagreeing on this because Paul says we're saved by faith alone, and James says, well, works are important too. They're actually not disagreeing. Both would have said, you know, our, our, our salvation is not dependent on what we're doing. We are saved because of what Jesus did, our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. But not when God saves us, He's not just saving us that we can be free of of guilt. He's saving us that we might be transformed, that we might bear fruit. That's sanctification, being changed to be more like Jesus. And therefore, both of them would have said, unless that's going on in our lives, then we haven't got the saving faith in the first place. So, our faith has to show itself in deeds. Are we ready for the Lord Jesus Christ to do that in our lives? That is really the challenge of this passage. Are we really willing to live out what He has done for us and what He has called us to be? The last example that this passage gives is Rahab. Now, again, this tests your Bible knowledge. Rahab, um, we find in the book of Joshua, Rahab is a citizen of Jericho. Um, Not only is she a citizen of Jericho, she's a prostitute. She's a woman with a a very poor reputation. And yet, when the children of Israel come into the promised land and Joshua sends two spies into Jericho, she recognizes something the whole city doesn't recognize. She recognizes that God is doing something, that God is about to change everything. And again, what does Rahab do? She does some very simple things. She offers them hospitality, and then she helps them get out of town. And as she does that, she gets a promise from them that when Jericho is destroyed, she will be delivered. She will be saved. You see, it's not just that she recognizes God. It's not just that she has the promise of what God will do for her, give her a future and a hope. It's that she acts on that. She gives over her life. The interesting thing is, the commentary I was reading was pointing out that if you go to Matthew chapter 1, and you find the genealogy of Jesus going all the way back from Abraham all through the generations, you will find Rahab. She married one of the Jewish people, and from her line, her descendant, that prostitute, came Jesus himself. And as I was reading that, I thought, and James... (laughs) As you see, our ancestor Rahab, he's talking about his own family. And so he's looking back and he's saying, see the example of shining faith. Faith in the promise, faith in what was to come, faith in this line that Rahab knew nothing about that would lead to the Messiah. And she responded to it. And I wonder as we look back in our family lines, we look back in the folk we've known in the past, we can see that as well, the shining example It's not just the people that taught us what to believe. It's not just the people that fanned up doctrine within us. Those things are important. It's the people that showed us what it meant to live for Jesus. You know those people? They maybe influenced you. It might be a minister or a Sunday school teacher or a friend or a relative. But but what you saw in them that made you want to follow Jesus more was not just that they taught you wonderful things and you remember all their Bible stories or whatever it was. It was there was something going on in their lives, wasn't it? It was in the love, it was in the deeds. It was the fact that when you looked at them, you saw what it meant to follow Jesus. And that is what is being called here for us today. We are secure because we know we are not saved by our works. We are saved by what he did, and therefore we have complete assurance. It's not about us trying to do more and trying to get better. But the joy of that, is to allow the Lord by His power, His glory, to work in our lives, that it be shown to the world around us that this is not just our words or our philosophical thoughts or our doctrine, but it is Jesus Christ at work in me. And the humility in that to know I get it wrong so often and so much, but He doesn't give up working in me and through me. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word, and we ask today that you would fill us with the joy of all that you have done for us in Jesus Christ, but more than that, that by your Holy Spirit, you would transform us, 
May we not just bless each other in words today, but may we go and ask what we may do to build each other up. May we not just pray that this world be changed with justice and righteousness and fairness for the poor, but we may go and work and live, relate and love in ways that bring your kingdom to bear. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to go on with our prayer because we've got a prayer from Christian Aid. Great God, who makes the sun to rise and opens the heavens, hear the cry of the people, people who sow in hope for rain but reap only despair. Hear the cry of the people, people seeking shelter from the storm, their homes and hopes submerged. Hear the cry of the people. When creation is heating back with rage and resistance, give us hope, grant us salvation. Give us a new relationship with creation, with reverence to tend this gift from you, and say once again of the earth and all you created, it is good. Amen. Amen. Hello. Just one or two announcements this morning. Um, first of all, we continue with midweek worship on Tuesday afternoon at two o'clock. If you'd like to come along to that, yeah, it's preferable if you can book for it, but it's not necessary. If you get up on Tuesday and think, I'd quite like to go this afternoon, please come along. You'd be very, very welcome. Next Sunday morning, as you know, we're going to welcome the moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland to our services. He'll be preaching at both services next Sunday. Um, I would imagine booking might be quite brisk, so if you want to get in early, please call from tomorrow or book through the online booking system. At the end of the service, can I ask the biggest majority of you to remain seating, seated so that the Sunday school parents can get out and get the children before the rest of us leave the sanctuary? It might avoid a bit of congestion outside. In the last issue of Kirk Matters, we announced the formation of a stewardship and finance committee to take over from Willie Brown, who's retiring as our treasurer. Now, there are six members in the committee Unfortunately, we're not able to bring them all here to show you this morning due to restrictions. So we are hopefully going to show you photographs of them. They are Audrey Hume, sorry, Max Ellis is up at the moment, Margaret Ellis, who is in the Sunday School. Audrey Hume, who's also teaching in the Sunday School. Good next one, Colin. David Cumming. Some of you will remember David Stad, who was Walter Cumming, who was one of our elders in the past. David Cop, who's with us this morning and Kirsty McMaster, who's convener of the group. Kirsty is also Brown Owl in our Brownies company. Um, the last member of the group is Dan Tudor. Dan, I don't think, has a photograph and he's quite shy, but he's sitting here this morning near the front. <laughs> Not that we're going to point him out. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, Willie is retiring as treasurer, I think it's his third attempt to retire, if I'm right. He kind of fell into the job. He offered to step in about 14 years ago when our previous treasurer retired or resigned from a job. And he said, look, I'll do it in the interim to get somebody else. Well, that interim period lasted 14 years. And I'm sure for Willie it's flown past. During the time, he's looked after all aspects of finances on our behalf. He's presented updates and accounts each month to the trustees of the church and has prepared annual accounts for us all and give, given financial updates at our annual stated meeting each year. I don't think any of us would realise the amount of work that he has put in over the years with complete transparency at all times. He has served us as a congregation faithfully and diligently. We have been truly blessed with Willie's dedicated service and we ask God's blessing on him and whatever he does in the future. Willie, we've got a gift for you. We can't hand it over to you personally, but it's sitting here if you'd like to collect it in the way out. And once again, thank you for everything that you have given to us 
and to serve God in the wider sense. Do you want to come and say anything? Or are you going to be shy? This church never fails to surprise you, does it? <coughs> As Helen said 14 years ago, the phrase I actually used was, if you don't find anything else, I'll give it a shot. Now that was just taken as I'll do it. So, But over the 14 years, you can't do these things by yourself. You've got to have assistance, and it's always in the background. There's been a great deal of assistance given. Um, you know, if I mention people like Christine and Ian, who look after dishing out the envelopes, which is kind of important. People who record the gift aid and, uh, and uh, allow you to claim it. Uh, things, things like that. So there's people in the background, although you might be the treasurer, there's people in the background that always assist you. Uh, and lastly, my lovely wife Anne, she's quite happy to get the cupboard in the dining room back that was full of all the papers I've had. Um, so it is, very, it is a very important role, but it's not the most important thing in the church. Finance is something you've got to look at, but we shouldn't let that cloud what we're, what we're here for. Uh, Helen mentioned the, the new finance committee, and I can assure you they are the most ca uh, capable bunch of people who will take us forward in looking after finances that allow us to promote the word of God as we move forward in the congregation. And finally, could I thank every member of the congregation for their uh, financial support over the last 14 years. Uh, it's quite humbling at any time we've required finance, we've actually received it. The congregation has been very, very supportive, especially during the pandemic, where I think everybody thought last March, a uh, year last March, that finances would be tight, with the exact opposite happened. Uh, the, con the, 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 the monies coming in from the, the congregation was quite exceptional, so I'd like to thank every member of the congregation, and I'm sure the support to the new finance committee uh, will continue. So thank you once again. And thanks, Helen. And um, our prayers are with the folk that will take over this ministry um, in, the in the days that come, that God will bless them and use them and continue um, his generosity to us. There are Christian aid envelopes on the chairs. Um, please do take them away with you. If you've got money and want to fill them in, you can hand them in just now, but I suspect many of us will want to go and think what we want to give uh, and return it next Sunday or, 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 or in, in, in the future um, as, as you feel God leads you to do that. We're going to close our service now as we hear Fraser sing for us. Look forward in faith. Look forward in faith, all time is in God's hand. Walk humbly with Him and trust His future plan. God has wisely led his people by his power. Look forward in hope, he gives us each new one. Look forward in faith, the world is in God's care. His purpose of love. He calls on us to share in our neighbor's need. The Lord is present still. He bless the meek. The earth will know God's will. Look forward in faith. God gives us life each day. Go onward with Christ, His Spirit guides our way. Now God let us live with Him the sphere of grace. Trust ever in Him, He rules our earth and space. Or
normally pronounce the benediction, but I wonder this morning, dare we? Dare we pray God's grace on each other? If you will, then look round as we do this and say with me the words of the grace to one another. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.